known, by the way, as a, a, a dove, a flaming bird. Uh, not because it's something like a, a phoenix, but when we see the Holy Spirit in Scripture, especially, especially in the New Testament, he takes the image of a dove. Uh, a dove descended on Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit when he was uh, baptized. When, uh, as we'll see in a second, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, it was a flame. So that it's usually the Spirit is shown as a flaming dove. Uh, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the, uh, the third member of the Trinity. We don't have a lot of time to do that this morning. That's another day. But the Holy Spirit is fully God as Jesus is fully God as the Father is fully God. The Holy Spirit is God. Not the force of God, not the effect of God, not just the, the vibe of God, but as God himself. Um, it is a misstatement for us to say there's Jesus is in my heart. It's not entirely accurate. The Holy Spirit indwells us, marks us as saved. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. He will return one day. Uh, that's, that's called the Judgment Day. But it's the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who seals us. Now, the Holy Spirit also um, empowers believers, each of us individually. Uh, he, he grows us. He makes us strong. It's only in the Spirit that we can say with meaning, Jesus is Lord. Anybody can say the words. I mean, anybody who doesn't even speak English can parrot the English words, Jesus is Lord. But it's to say it with meaning and that personal ownership that's only in, in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our mark of salvation. He illuminates Scripture, uh, anybody can look at the words they pay, well, that's what's being said. The Holy Spirit takes that Scripture and puts it in our mind and heart and soul in a way that mere reading can't. Uh, he empowers us. He builds up the church. And I want you to notice I'm saying he, not it. It is an object. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a, is, is a person in the Trinity, not just a thing. Uh, but the Holy Spirit builds up the church, unifies the church brings the church together, and Christ is the cornerstone. But it's the Holy Spirit that grows me as a Christian and knits us all together. We, as the church, Twin Cities, and us a part of all the churches, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit who is that cement in between each of us as bricks. And that's that. Uh, Jesus says he's the helper, the advocate. He helps us. He helps us as church. Um, it's his role. He is, he is present with us in every day and every gathering. Finally, he is the giver of gifts. We talk a good bit here at our church about spiritual gifts. It's important that we know where they come from, the Holy Spirit. Jesus and God the Father might be directing the Holy Spirit to give us gifts, but, this, but the gifts themselves come from the Holy Spirit. When the, the moment you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells you, fills you. And it's in that moment he begins to give and then cultivate certain spiritual gifts. Not talents, not skill sets, not hobbies. Certain, we'll call them abilities or leanings that will help you serve in our church and build it up. Does that make sense? Right. Um, uh, Chris Wall plays the guitar. That's a talent. That's a skill. Most human beings can practice that and become good. Most can. It would take a really musically inept person to never have this skill, no matter who taught them. The Holy Spirit is not just saying, you know what, you're good at the guitar, gift of music. It, it's not like that. It's, it's not a skill. It's... Um, I think a loose term would be like an, a motivation. So uh, we'll go through a short list, and it's not like you're the only one who has this ability or responsibility. It's that when that need arises, you're just naturally the first one to show up and say, okay, let's do this. You're sort of the, the one who would organize the church to act in such a way. I, I, I wouldn't call it leadership. It's motivation. It's a... Um, a desire that's implanted by the Spirit. But I, I think when we look at those lists, or the list that I have, it'll be a little bit clearer. Does that help? Okay. Anyone else before I move on? You said supernatural. What do you mean by supernatural? Well, laser beams. Laser beams. Well, lasers are very physical. Uh, 
laser emitting diodes are real physical things. Supernatural, let's say, uh, for example, like the, the first one to set all this up is the gift of wisdom. This is not just a being very smart. It's not just having experience and reading a lot of books. It's when the need arises for, let's say, sound biblical advice. You're not necessarily the one who speaks first, but the, when you speak, it seems to carry a little bit more weight and distance. Not because of how awesome you are, but because how the Spirit is using you in particular in that moment to solve a problem or to encourage or build up a church. So it is precise. Yes, they are very precise. Like laser. Like a laser, that's right. <laughs> are they made of lasers? No. But uh, it, is, it is very specific. Um, Paul will make a reference to the, the human body. Um, he says that the church is like a body. There's different members or body parts. Now, even in his day, they understood what is called gross anatomy, the big ma major parts of the body, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, whatever. We get into a lot more specifics with things like cells and genetics or whatever. But we understand that, um, I don't know, you, you drink coffee. Well, the tongue makes saliva that will start to break those sugars down. It goes into the stomach, the esophagus, and all the muscles, and then there's a, like a pulsating uh, muscles that will uh, chew it all up, enzymes, and all the parts of your body, using energy, excretion, all those things are necessary. Much like at a church, every spiritual gift is necessary, and every Christian has either one that nobody else has or their own flavor of that gift. Every member is important, much, uh, much like every part of a laser is important. Thank you, Dave. Yes, <laughs> of course. Okay, so uh, words here. Uh, when we say the edification of the church, it's the church. Even the gift of evangelism is primarily for the church. All the spiritual gifts are to build the church up. Evangelism reaches out and brings people in, but it's for the church's sake, not first for the lost sake. Wow. Edification is a big word. It means to build up or encourage. When, you, when I uh, tell my son, good job at listening to daddy, <laughs> I'm edifying him, I'm building him up. When... Um, at our core retreat this past weekend, or this weekend, we talked about here are some things our church is doing well. It was encouraging. That's edification. That's a big Christian-y word that just means we're building up, not tearing down. All the gifts are meant to build up the church, not anybody else, at least not primarily. Does that make sense? No, I'm saying that our first priority is the church. Then it's the lost. Most of the spiritual gifts can impact the lost, the non-Christian. But that's not their first responsibility. Um, it's for the church, and the stronger and more built up the church is, the better it is in, at bringing others in. If the evangelist goes and brings in the lost to a really unhealthy church, what's the point? So first and foremost, you get your own house in order. It becomes, and I don't like this word about the church, but attractive. It makes sense. What you're saying and how you're living are the same. I want to be a part of that. Not, you're saying some good stuff, but people don't like each other. Or you're very mean here, or it's just oppressive here. Is, it, is that helpful? I'm all for the lost. I, I, I mean, I was once lost, you know. And now I'm found. They won't help me. But, I, but that's not the church's job. The church's job first is to take care of the church. But taking care of ourselves, we're best able to bring in others and minister to the outsiders. Anybody else? Okay. I want to go through a few of these. The first one, and I might have to look to make sure I have an order here, is wisdom. Again, uh, uh, not just knowledge, but um, an understanding. Uh, being able to say the right thing at the right time, in the right circumstances, in the right way. Wisdom. Uh, having a sense of experience without having had that experience. Uh, knowledge. This is not just book learning, but it's the ability to learn or speak truth in a place that needs it. Um, the next one here is going to be faith. We, we should all have faith. And by the way, all of us in one way or another should have all of these gifts. Well, characteristics. Spiritual gift is a magnification of that attribute for you. We should all have faith. If Sue has the gift of faith, and I don't know if she does, I'm making this up. But if she has a gift of faith... It's when our church needs a rock of faith right now, she just shines. She becomes this anchor for our church in the midst of maybe conflict. Yes, she does. <laughs> True. We, we should all have knowledge and wisdom. But especially when our church needs like a rallying point for wisdom, 
that's when the person with that gift shines. Does that make sense? Um, you, does anybody know what your pancreas makes? when you have sugars in your diet. When you eat a bunch of cake or, or muffins or caribou, your, your pancreas leaps into action. You, you don't need the pancreas if you're just on like a, a meat binge, right? You're just eating beef. You don't need insulin. We don't need that rock of faith every moment or every day because we should all have faith. Somebody in those moments of need, that person is pushed, shown in the forefront. Um, healing. This is a rare one. Uh, this is not like, let's just heal the, the relationships. I mean, physical healing. Uh, I myself have never healed anybody. Uh, I have heard stories. I've been in the vicinity of healing, but I've never witnessed it. Some people do. This is a rare one. Uh, not all gifts are going to be as common. Let's say that Kim has the gift of, of healing. She could... Possibly in that moment of man, I have a stein mind. Walk over and pray, and it, it, it be done. Does that happen a lot? I don't know. Um, my opinion, my opinion, my opinion is that if somebody had the gift of healing, they wouldn't be making a fuss about it because it's so easily look at me. So if it is happening, I, I'm thinking it's going to be happening sort of in the background because we, we don't want to make the gifts about ourselves. It's about the church. Miracles, this is more general. This could include healing, but um, things like, uh, I don't know, there's not a lot of examples other than healing. Uh, maybe a little bit more of um, an instinct about spiritual warfare, maybe. It, it, it might be, um, I don't know, uh, miraculously doing a thing that wasn't a person that you would never know otherwise. It might have something to do with um, restoring a person uh, in their, not, not physical sense, but in their spiritual well-being. You know, to speak a word in their life and they're just miraculously like, well, okay, it's all better. Uh, miracles tend to be healing-ish. Uh, some miracles, I know that Jesus, as far as we know, did one cursing miracle. He cursed the fig tree and it just died. That, that's an aggressive miracle. Uh, when Peter said to An uh, Ananias and Sapphira, how dare you lie to God? And they just dropped dead. That's a miracle. Um, so when Peter was saying to Ananias and Sapphira, you stole from God, you lied to him, and they die, that's for the health of the church. For one, it removes a liar. Two, it teaches the rest of us that not stealing from God is important. Being honest is important. Um, the next one is going to be mercy. This is not just like I'm a kind person, but you're very considerate and mindful of people who are hurting, who are in prison, who are suffering overseas, who have a great need in their life. A person who wants to do these acts of, uh, of kindness and compassion. We should all be this way. But again, in that moment where there's a need, those individuals tend to want to motivate the, the, the rest of us. They're, um, they're driving us on. Uh, discernment. This is, we'll often uh, see this with things like sermons, lessons, books, or what uh, people are talking about. Somebody will say X, Y, and Z, and this, this uh, uh, person will, get, will, will start to dissect it. Uh, well, let's see, is that good or bad? Is that right or wrong? Let's really hammer that down. Not in an, um, a cruel way, but to say we have to be about truth and goodness and righteousness. And if you're going to step away from that, these are like your immune system. They're making sure everything is as it should be. They're uh, in a situation, you get a, a visitor who comes into the church. They're like, you know, this guy over here, I, I think he needs just to be welcome. I just, there's, there's, I, I get a sense I'm supposed to be doing that. I'm discerning, I'm trying to figure out, I'm seeing behind things that somebody needs a hug or a word of encouragement or a phone call. Almost like, um, yeah, like an immune system. Next, service. We should all be serving. We should all be discerning. But service is, especially for the hurting, who are sick, uh, oftentimes the person with the spiritual gift of, of mercy 
either also has service or is good friends with people who have the gift of service. They tend to work together. I, I, I feel for you, let's go do something. Um, a lot of push for like, leave my serving children, let's go on mission trips, let's go to Haiti, let's go rebuild, let's gather money for this and that. They're very motivated to make sure others' needs are being met. Uh, for myself, I mean, I try to think about all of us, like who would I put here? I don't know about you, but I see Chor as this person. He's always just I'm like, what do you need? He's, he's just that guy. In fact, even when you don't need me, he's bringing me. Like, he's, he, he wants to serve everybody with food. Um, teaching. This one's uh, obvious in the name. They're teachers. They're explainers. They want to make sure everybody understands. Uh, sometimes they might have also gift of discernment, but it's, I want to understand. I want to understand. I want you to understand. And, and I'm going to explain it the best I can to you. Uh, exhortation. This is not necessarily preachers. They're, they're people who talk who will say things in the right way, they want to encourage, they want to gather, they want to rally, but it's a lot of speaking. They're the ones who are, I don't know, just the encouragers of, of the group. We, we, we should all be exhorting, but these are the people who will start that, that movement. It also uh, might be, you need to be held accountable. The exhorters are going to be one of the first ones to do that. They're one of the first ones to talk to you. Giving, it should be obvious, they're going to be very sacrificial in their giving. Leaders, this is not just let's train somebody to be a leader. You can train anybody to have the skill set of a leader. You cannot train the spiritual gift of leadership. This is far more natural. This is not, hey, I'm a leader now, name tag. It's just by their nature, people follow them. They tend to be, in and of themselves, ralliers. They have an idea, they act, others will fall in line behind. Uh, tongues, and we're going to be at today. The gift of tongues is somewhat controversial. In my opinion, because it's like healing, it can be very easily self-reflecting, self-glorifying. Let's, uh, we're going to look at two passages and say there's two kinds of things that we mean in the gift of tongues. I myself have never spoken in tongues. Um, I oftentimes pray that God would give me this gift so we could have a, a conversation in Mongolia very easily. Uh, I am not a language person. I, I am terrible at languages. So first things first, Acts 2. The first time we see this happening. And it's because the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit sends tongues of fire on the apostles. Then they speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. And everybody hears in their own language. Now let's look at some Greek uh, terms here. Greek is far more specific than English. The, uh, uh, on, on the, the typical word is glossa. Say glossa. Oh. It means the tongue. Uh, it means that. The tongue is one of our biggest muscles used to make sounds. It's not necessarily the, the vocal cords, but your tongue. It does a lot of work. It's a euphemism for a language. So <clears throat> they speak with tongues. And they have utterance. Big word here. Apostagomai. Say apostagomai. 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 Aren't you glad you don't have to actually learn Greek? <laughs> apostagomai means to utter or to speak in a very um, articulate way. It's not broken English or whatever. It's fluency. It's understanding and learning. They were given utterance by the Holy Spirit. They could speak and everybody heard in their own language or dialect. Now, this is a careful word. It's not just like, and this is not the case, but if somebody who was at Pentecost, their native language was English, they wouldn't just hear in any old English. It'd be their specific natural form of English. So, for example, in Minnesota, what do you call a Coca-Cola? Oh, Coca-Cola. Pop. 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 Don't you? Oh. Where I'm from, South uh, Carolina, we call it a Coke. In Minnesota, you just call it a Sprite, a pop. In the South, in the South, we call a Sprite a Coke. We call a Dr. Pepper a Coke, and a Mr. Piv a Coke, and Pepsi a Coke. So when you go to a restaurant, it's, what do you want? A Coke, what kind? A Sprite. And that's just how it is. So, and, and I'm, I'm just as an example. If Peter had said, you know, Coca-Cola, I would have heard Coke, you would have heard pop. 
We're hearing in our dialect. I, I am from the South. I say things like y'all and dad gum. Minnesotans don't. They say, oh yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't shut up. Oh yeah. You'll bet you. In Acts, they're not just like Peter is not speaking in Spanish and French and Russian. He's speaking in his language. And everybody else is hearing in their own native language. This is one version of what we mean by the gift of tongues. Somehow you can either understand or be understood uh, a language you've never learned. Again, I pray for this all. I've been working at Hmong churches since 2001, <laughs> and I still, I still struggle. I'm not a language person. This is not my gifting at all. Um, so I'm going to stop for a second. Are there any thoughts or questions on this? Yes? In the Hmong language, the choir is in Pepsi. Yeah, Pepsi, yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, Pepsi. Yeah. So really, the Hmong people and, and Southerners are more alike than you might think. <laughs> Mountain people, we like to farm, we like to be left alone. That's why I like you guys. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? I wonder what they call it in Spanish. Tongues? <laughs> no. Um, Pepsi. 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 <laughs> yeah, what do you guys call it in Spanish? Uh, Como se no. dice uh, uh, Coca-Cola. We hear Coke, Pop, and Fresca. Agua Fresca. Fresca. But Peter would have said, let's say, whatever the Hebrew is for Coke, and we would have all understood it. This is, if you talk to missionaries, they'll occasionally say that somebody could just understand that language and move on. I've never done this, I wish I could. Um, and this is not, I have, like, I sometimes think that my wife has this gift because she can learn a, a language like, like, like nothing. But then I think, well, but she has to learn it. Yeah, I don't think I have this gift. But she has, let's say, like a half a gift to be able to do that. I wish I, I could. One, one time she was like, you know, Ben, we should do for fun, learn Portuguese. And I looked at her and said, that is the least thing I would want to do right now. Like, Portuguese? Nobody really speaks that anymore. And if they do, they also speak English. Uh, I don't want to learn Portuguese. <laughs> like, it's, why? Like, it'd be fun. No, it would not. I'd rather do math. I'm not. Secondly, is what Paul is doing with the church in Corinth. In Sunday school, in my Sunday school, we're going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. The church in Thessalonica is a good, healthy church. The church in Corinth is not. Paul is rebuking them most of this letter. They are saying, one, that the gift of tongues is the best gift. Number two, look, I can speak in tongues, or I speak in tongues three times a day, and you only two times a day, and they're using it to, to have like a superiority. Well, I mean, you laugh. Look at me, I can do this. And Paul starts out in chapter 12 by saying, here's how the spiritual gifts kind of work. In 14, he lays out specifically prophecy tongues. And he he, he kind of walks us through it. So here he says the gift of tongues. And so it's the language. You're speaking other languages in service, in prayer, in whatever you want. Now, there are some problems here. When Paul starts to teach about this, he lifts off some pretty key attributes. So this version of tongues here, this kind of gift, is you're speaking things you've never learned, maybe nobody's ever heard before. It might not even conform to an actual language. A key thing that Paul will talk about is this is primarily meant for your private, at-home prayer and worship time. This is not necessarily meant for the church, and we'll see why in a second. He says this, he, he, he never says stop doing it, not once. He just gives a lot of order to the practice. Um, without order, that there can be no freedom. He wants them to be free in Christ, but they have had no order, so it's anarchy. He says when, when a person prays or speaks in tongues, they don't know what they're saying. It's their spirit that is praying or talking. Not the Holy Spirit here. The Holy Spirit has given them this gift for their own solar spirit to behave in this way. This is important because I have known a few people 
who have said, oh yeah, I just I pray in tongues whenever I, I pray. I pray over my food in tongues. And it, you mean you're in charge of that? Like, you know what you're saying? Oh yeah. Paul says that the mind doesn't know. That, uh, that's in chapter 4. You, you don't know what you're doing. It's not you in control. It's your spirit being, let's use a term, set loose to just uh, praise God. And if it's out loud, it, it doesn't sound intelligible to anybody else. Now, it could be that, let's say, Mary is at, at, at home and she prays in tongues, but it's German. Could be. I don't know. I'm not with her. But it's your spirit just praying. Now, it is unclear uh, that if this gift is like other gifts, we should all be merciful and wise and discerning. I see nowhere in Scripture where we should all be doing this. Yes, ma'am. not be thinking, oh, I'd rather say this than that. It's, 